Hi, folks. Hello. Hey. Greetings, everybody. Oh, I see that we have assistant manager Linda Williams <laughs> on here. Yeah. Yeah. I think Robin was, Robin, did you get the request to be my co-host? <laughs> yes, I did. I said, that, that's fine. I can handle it. Okay. All right. Robin is our high tech council member. Uh, I wouldn't call myself high tech, maybe medium tech. <laughs> I think Robin, you know, given his youth is someone we need to rely on for technology. Sounds good to me. Don't rely on me. Okay. Hello, Shannon. <laughs> okay, I think we'll begin as soon as, um, but I think Attorney Bolt is supposed to be here. He's coming in now. Oh, good. And so is 908-3220, that's Doug also, isn't it? Yeah. That is Doug, yes. Doug is, Doug is super technology. Okay, so I, I noticed that the time is 5.30, so I'm, I'm gonna call this to order. And Linda, if you can put it on record. And um, we, we got a call today that uh, council member Kumar would not be able to be here, but since it's recorded, uh, we're in good shape. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the town manager had a conflict, but we are uh, ably staffed by Linda and our town attorney. And so I know there was a little bit of confusion about what the topic was gonna be tonight. And we, we didn't really meet to prepare an agenda, but so, what I'm gonna suggest is that we, we do two things tonight. The first is I believe that the town attorney uh, is in the process of preparing a memo regarding some protocols for our, for our hearings. And, and I, while I don't think he was able to send it in advance, I was hoping that on the spot, he would be able to um, uh, give a few highlights and then, and then maybe uh, there could be some question and answer. And then after that, I think really the primary purpose of this meeting was supposed to be to begin a discussion of which recommendations regarding building code changes from the stormwater study committee, the council wish to move forward on. Is, is that correct, Mr. President? And we've only scheduled this for a half for an hour tonight. So perhaps we can start with uh, you're prepared, Mr. Ten Attorney, to to give a few highlights on on some protocols you wanted to go over. Is that right? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm not preparing a memo. I'm happy to do so, but okay. Well, then you can prepare a memo if the council asks for it afterward. Okay, because okay. I, I know that Matt had brought that idea up, but anyway. So that we'll spend some time on that, and then, and then I'll turn it over to the president to uh, to have a brief discussion on maybe some of the um, uh, potential uh, code amendments you might want to make that came forth from the stormwater committee, and how what, what the process might be. And we, and we will conclude at 6.30, as had been discussed. So with that, I will turn it over to our distinguished town attorney. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And you know, frankly, I think that the town was well prepared to present to the circuit court in connection with the recent appeal, the administrative record, and the record was in really good shape, you know, such that I don't think we have to amend our protocol at all, really, the particularly helpful was when the mayor went through and described what items were in the record already. And I would urge us to continue that practice because it helps everybody understand what is and isn't in the record. And as we've discussed 
a bit before, you know, we've we've mentioned now at a, a couple hearings that there's some things in the code that could use clarification or perhaps replacement and expansion. And so there I thought would be the you know, the, the focus going forward, you know, not protocol per se, but are we to the point where we want to, for example, think about the quiet enjoyment language that's in the code? You know, is it perhaps time to replace that with with something else and a you know, possible option would be deleting the broad phrase you know quiet enjoyment and instead detailing with substantive requirements what things relate to quiet enjoyment that the town is regulating you know for example should there be a maximum building height maximum lot coverage requirement non-vegetative surface coverage requirement you know additional setbacks, wall plane length restriction, wall plate height restriction, these these types of architectural building tools, sculpting tools that can help limit the mass and scale of structures to prevent the feeling of looming for neighbors. And these can be done in, in combination with stormwater drainage regulations and so they they can complement each other. And then lastly, now that the stormwater drainage ordinance has been tested through, you know, one hearing, as we discussed a little bit at the last work session, would the committee or council recommend any any tweaks to that framework now? So uh, that's basically the, the general <laughs> framework that I would have like for the discussion. I, I think you also uh, wanted to talk about maybe review again the ex parte rule and also to talk about the some of the language that is used during the discussion that that the um how it's important to not uh talk about potential changes to the law but to because the point of the hearing is for the council to apply the law to the application not to talk about that oh do they have a problem with the law or they want to change the law because i think that 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 causes confusion it also might um uh cause a problem if the case is appealed is that right yeah that's right and it's it's difficult to not do so but yet as the mayor stated i i think it would be appropriate for the council at hearings just to apply the code as it is written and to the extent that areas are identified for clarification or possible amendment, that we should do that separately because if, if that's discussed you know, during the hearing, it might provide a basis for the decision to be challenged. You know, if, if for example, a majority of the council were to indicate that, you know, that that particular law shouldn't be enforced or isn't clear, you know, that 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 type of thing might present a problem for us so it would be better to go ahead and clean up the code to the extent we find anything is falling short or unclear and can you also uh, again I, I know I, you know i i applaud you know i i know uh this is it's very difficult it, it, one of the hardest things that we do is to is holding these hearings because we really have to be practically trained judges, especially when when so many of the applicants and the and the the neighbors are lawyers. And so but but it's just it's just better that we keep our comments to a minimum so that we don't go off on tangents and start talking about policy or changes. So as the as the town attorney points out, it could it could cause a problem if there's an appeal. But also, um, can you can you also give another uh, primer on the ex parte rule? Sure, absolutely. And, and 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 that's another area where it's but where the less said the better, too. Correct. Well, it, it depends on the the circumstances. I mean, just by way of general background, again, variance hearings are due process hearings. We need to give 
the party's ample opportunity to be notified of their interests and the actions that might impact their interests. All parties need to be witness to what evidence is submitted on the record so that they have the opportunity to rebut it. So for that reason, the council members should avoid ex parte communications, discussing applications with interested parties off the record. You know, for example, if a neighbor were to come to you and say, I'm thinking about filing an application for this or that, what do you think my chances are? You know, obviously you tell them, because I'm a decision maker in that case, I can't discuss it with you. Everything's got to be on the record, but feel free to reach out to staff. If, if council members visit the site and you know, gain impressions about the property, those impressions should be put on the record. And similarly, if council members do any independent research, the results of that research should be put on the record. And that should be done before the record closes so that other parties have the opportunity to rebut that information. We shouldn't, for example, add stuff to the record for the first time during deliberations when it's too late for the interested parties to rebut or comment on that information. Uh, if it inadvertently happens, it's easy to correct. And we can just always just reopen the record and give the opportunity for other parties to comment. I think that's it, Mr. Mayor. Were there any okay, other questions? and then also okay, and then and then I'm gonna um, open it up for questions in a minute. But also to clarify that everything you just said about the ex parte rule also applies to the mayor, correct? correct. Because the mayor is potentially a a one of the decision makers. That's right. So that's I, the so the mayor that. is supposed to. And do you think it's would it be necessary for would it, would it be helpful or necessary for us to have any kind of written documentation about that, that we have to, so that, so that, you know, like in the future, when someone gets elected to the council, we give them, we give them a, a packet or something. I don't know. Um, so council president Serco, do you have any questions about uh, what the town attorney has raised tonight no thank you for the uh just the, the refresher on ex parte communications okay thank you councilor Bar. do you have any wisdom to share all or comments or questions it's all clear and largely familiar no questions okay thank you council member heller you're you're muted not for long um I guess I really don't really understand the ex parte business. Can we explain that for people that are guidance counselors and not lawyers? Sure. So yeah, ex parte basically means off the record. We try to avoid things that are off the record and things. What do I mean by things? Discussions, you know, in, independent research that might cause the decision maker to be swayed one way or the other without the interested parties in the case having the benefit of knowing that council member has that evidence and didn't have the opportunity to rebut it. So if, for example, let's say a variance is pending and the applicant were to, were to come to a council member and say, you know, this is why we want to do this addition. This is why we've designed it this way, so on and so forth. And that discussion, leads the council member to believe that the request is appropriate before the decision even takes place. You know, so the, the process might be prejudiced because the council member has already made a decision about the case before the hearing's been held and before an opponent to the case has you know, had the opportunity to present their case, for example. So we, yes, was there a question? But, um, someone... well, hold on a second. I, you'll get a chance, Councillor. So, Councillor Heller, does that answer? Do you have any further questions about that? Well, I guess the only thing I would ask along that line is so that means that we have 
you know, I, I read the agenda and I see we have, we're going to, we're going to talk about a variance mm -hmm. and maybe I walk by the house to look at it. So I understand it better. That's okay. Cause I'm just looking at the house, right? Correct. Yeah. That's okay. But while you're there, don't you know, talk to people, don't talk to anybody about it. And you should put your, you know, observations on the record to the extent they have a bearing on your decision so that the interested parties can have the opportunity to comment on or rebut on what you observed. So you know, stated another way, all the evidence that you consider in determining a, a case should be on the record so that everybody understands what all the evidence is that the council members have. So let's say, for example, an applicant was arguing that they're entitled to a variance for retaining walls because they have steeply sloping topography and a council member were to walk by the property before the hearing to take a look at the topography and view it from the, the sidewalk. At the hearing, the council member would say, I visited the property in preparation for this hearing and here's what I observed. You know, in my opinion, the topography is steeper than the neighbors or is not steeper than the neighbors. And that way the applicant and any other interested parties will understand you know, what evidence you've taken in terms of you know, your, your visual inspection so that they could say, for example, well, I understand you, you, you might think my topography is not steep, but uh, maybe you only looked at these two properties. I went around the town and you know here's five other examples that I think are are similar. And that that sort of placement of the evidence on the record you know, should be done during the question and comment period. You know, rather than during, let's say, the you know deliberations after the record is closed. So that if anyone does want to comment the record's not yet closed i get it thank you so so does that mean so so let's say that councilor heller sees an agenda item the wednesday before the meeting and she goes she drives by the uh, property on friday and has some observations would you suggest that she then write those in to be put on the record so that that all parties can know that in advance of the hearing or or, or what do you you know you know it's um, my goal I would, that we I would, do everything i would say that, no okay. because we we try to avoid deliberations among council members prior to the hearing if okay. one council member were to submit notes into the record before the hearing, that might that might indicate that the council members are discussing things beforehand, which we want to avoid. I would just say do it at do it at the hearing. So during the question and comment period, and if a council member observes something that has a bearing on their decision, they could just state that at the hearing during the comment period. I think that Okay, works. thank you. Councilor Heller, does that yes, does that answer all your questions? Okay, thank you. Does, I'm thank sorry, Councilor Rovac. I'll get to you, Councilor Barr after. Councilor Rovac, did you have some questions of the town attorney? Oh no, I was just wondering because um when in one of the last variance hearings that we had um someone who was maybe had questions, not the applicant. They waited outside my home until I got home and gave me like a packet of information. Is that after legal? the hearing? No, before. Oh. Can yeah, then I would I would just I would take just take that information and just say thank you. I would I would say well don't give it to me, give it to the town manager and the town manager will add it to the record. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Councillor Barr, you had another question. Yeah, and this is about visiting the home. I mean, I, I actually think it's just good practice by a council member 
when you've got a building permit application to, to have a look at the home if it's not highly familiar with you to you already and, and a look around it so that you have an actual visual memory of the home uh, before whatever construction is being done on it or around it. Um, so I certainly don't think a written record is needed off that and, and by all means, yes, you bring it up, say I visited it during the hearing, but it, it just it strikes me as good practice that we should do that. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Councilman Barr, because uh, I believe there is a requirement now that applicants submit photos of or drawings of the property. I think photos, maybe. So, so, and I and I completely understand why it's more uh, powerful or informative to actually go view the property. But I'm wondering if there is any other information that we could ask the applicant to submit in advance that we don't now. I, we do, don't, I, I believe we do require a photo of the property. Isn't that right? Because that's new. Well, a site plan is required. A site plan. And, and elevation drawings of what's proposed. Um, photographs of existing conditions are often submitted I don't know off the top of my head, Mr. Mayor, whether that's required. I can look right now. Doug may know. Are you Doug, there, do Doug? You know? And do you know whether photos are required by the code? I believe yeah, I believe it says somewhere in that they are, and we get them about 90% of the time. Okay. Sometimes it's just doesn't seem relevant. Okay. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to turn it over uh, for the next, uh, for the remaining time for the, to the council president to lead a discussion on the um, building code proposals that were made by the by the study committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Matt emailed me a nice uh, summary of notes of some of the options that have been presented, but it didn't, it didn't seem as though he sent it to the entire council. Did anybody else receive a four page list? Nope. 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 Okay. Um, and I don't, I'm not able to share in my current setup. So I'll just go through it and I can ask Matt to uh, provide it after the meeting. Um, so there, there are a couple of, there are a number of areas where we could, we as a council could take action to uh, update our code. Um, I think the first category or area is clarifying or updating the current stormwater code. Um, for example, uh, let me just read this. New code provisions should clarify that the town prioritizes proposed stormwater management solutions as follows. Storage with full on-site filtration. If that is not fully available, storage with some on-site infiltration and delayed release of stored water that does not infiltrate. Um, and uh, Robin, uh, Matt noted that uh, you proposed a, um, a tiered approach and we could actually spell it out in the code where you know, conservation landscaping using things such as rain gardens um, is like the most preferred. Next, there would be structural uh, measures to hold the water, um, then treatment, and then last but not least would be a variance. You know, if it's just not at all achievable. Well, no, it's like three levels. It's it's um, rain gardens, et cetera, landscaping interventions, if you will, which are, I mean, that's mm -hmm. at the top. Um, the second one is things like dry wells, um, which mm -hmm. hold the water and dissipate it on the land. And that's, that's, that's their virtue. And then third level is cisterns or tanks, which hold the water for a temporary period, but then release it subsequently. Right. So, uh, and for clarifying. Um, we might want to, or I think we probably should 
clarify storage versus treatment of stormwater. And there was the question that Matt noted, what do we really want to achieve? What is feasible? Um, so, so these are some thoughts. Um, before we go on to some other areas, I was just thinking we have a, a little uh, like virtual around the table discussion. Um, and I, Robin, very much appreciate your uh, tiered approach. And let's see, who do we have? And we have Debbie and Shaman, but we don't have Kabir. Okay, so um, Shannon, what do you think about the need to make some changes and some of these proposed approaches just to help us shape our further debate? So, um, I mean, this is a totally off the record or off the subject um, thing, but I mean, is there anything that we can do to start pushing Montgomery County to take more like important stormwater um, runoff management practices themselves? Because that will definitely benefit us if they can take a harder hand on it. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but just throwing it out there. Number one. Number two. As I know from my own experience next door, just because you go and put something in, you know, to serve, uh, you know, to be okay for our own town permit doesn't mean that it works. And so what I'm finding next door to me is it doesn't work. And how are we going to then continue to police all of this stuff? Because we can sit here and say, yeah, rain guard in this, or, you know, we can say cistern that or whatever. But when the soil is as it is, there's nothing to say that these things are going to actually work. Right. Um, the... Some of that is county, like county has a requirement to inspect the, um, the tanks, but other issues are um, questions of compliance would be for a town compliance officer. Right. Um, it's like really who's going around and monitoring any of these dry wells and, you know, these things that we're telling these people to put in, I, I mean, I don't the, the, I don't the, know. Okay. The, county, the county supposedly, and I, I'm putting supposedly in there, has a once every three year inspection of the dry wells, except they do not have the staff to be able to do that. So it's not really happening is the issue. Um, right. so they are supposed to be inspected. Town of Chevy Chase does, does do their inspection of the dry wells. That, that is real. Um, but we would need to do our own inspections because though the county is supposed to do them, they're not doing them. Well, let, let me just add one thing here is that, you know, when when this whole process started, uh, the town manager and I in, informed Councilmember Friedson about it, and he offered to do uh, what he could. So I, I do think that um, while perhaps we need to think about the ways that we can cover that ourselves, we also want to work with our council member, our county council member, to see, you know, to make sure that the county does the very least they can do, and then we can supplement it. But, but so I, I do think we should take advantage of that offer at some point. But this isn't this isn't to contradict anything Councilmember Barr is saying. I have a question along that line. If if we supplement what the county does with our own inspection person, our own compliance officer. Legally, do the residents have to follow what we say? Or they can say, wait, you know what? County, we follow, you know, we're, we're, we've been approved by the county and the county says our dry, walls are, our dry walls are fine. And then we come up and say, no, they're not fine. It's, we, we give a permit too, remember, so that if we've approved their dry well under our town permit, then we have the right to but like, so there's, there's the attenuation device that's in that doesn't, that doesn't drain water. And it was permitted by our town. And, you know, I don't think there's anything that our town can do to go back to them to say that 
it doesn't work because they got their permit. Why can't we say if it doesn't work? You, you know, then fix it. It's like anything. Maybe else. the town attorney can answer that. What is our recourse? Well, if if it's a violation of town code, that you know, the town has the ability to enforce the code. I mean, it depends on where the the violation has occurred. If you if you do impose stormwater drainage requirements at the permitting stage, then likely there's not going to be any you know violations unless someone's done work without a permit. Yeah. Right. I mean, for, for the case that Shannon's talking about, the stormwater code was not in effect at the time that that building approval was granted. So we probably do not have the authority in the town ourselves to fault him on that, um, I'm afraid. Right. But if, 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 if somebody, just because we didn't give them a permit and, and, and the building is done and everybody's happy, except all of a sudden it pours and rains, you know, and, and the next person is flooded out. Who's responsible here? Is it the homeowner, homeowner that's flooding you out? You well, if, if, there, if there's been a violation of the county law, then the homeowner that has been impacted can ask the county to enforce. If there's no violation of town law because there's no town law, no town permit, no violation of, of county law, then there still may be a private right of action because Generally speaking, one neighbor cannot create a nuisance for an abutting neighbor, and that's typically a neighbor to neighbor issue. The law generally provides that water is allowed to flow downhill, but you know, if construction results in the artificial capturing of water and channeling it in an, in an artificial manner to the neighbor, for example, a, a sub pump, collects water and if, you, if that sub pump discharge was then pointed at the property line and creating flooding at a particular point you know, that could be deemed an artificial capturing and conveying of water that creates a, a private nuisance and a, a cause of action so like i think that maybe i mean you know i feel like we should think about this on like very broad terms like if we limit the number or the amount of um impervious land in a lot that might help us like be able to monitor and then in in return perhaps catch more storm water than suggesting they put in these devices that you know aren't approved by the county and on a county level and that we also don't have anyone to monitor and you know all of those things like so if we were to say from the beginning like look you can't have a separate driveway garage um patio pool and gigantic house you know if we didn't say that from the beginning maybe we would be we would just limit some of this runoff organically from that so that's it's a great suggestion you're sort of jumping ahead on the list those would be okay. new things that we could but I mean, I, I think we need to like think holistically in terms of like how we want these, like all of these like things to be, you know, I don't think that we want to make it difficult for a neighbor to put up a back deck if they so desire, you know, I, I don't think that we want to limit thoughtful um, renovations, you know, I mean, it depends what we want to limit as a town, I guess. Like, I I think that it, you, if you want to add on a back room, you should be able to, you know. But, um, you know, creating these McMansion houses with just impervious spots everywhere and tons of runoff that goes into our streets, like, that's what, in my view, I would like to avoid. Right. Yeah. I mean, we'll get there, <laughs> is what Steve's trying to say. Um, at the moment, what Steve was trying to get at was the initial recommendation. Do you want to repeat it, Steve, because we kind of lost its thread there? Well, um, I will, but before I forget in terms of the thread, uh, Shannon, you also, the, your first point was about engaging the county and, and not just compliance issues, but maybe rules issues. Um, and I think this is where 
we are fortunate to have uh, Mayor Slavin and he knows the individuals. So I think, I think it is very possible to get the county to change its rules and, and improve its enforcement of those rules. But I, I don't think that would be a speedy process. I would expect it to be a slow process that would require collaboration with other local jurisdictions. Um, so I, I don't know if you had any comments or thoughts you wanted to say, Jeffrey? Well, you, you know, I think what I think would be great is if we compiled a document that uh, detailed, uh, uh, outlined some of the, the uh, outstanding recommendations and conclusions that the committee made. Because I think that Andrew, that uh, Councilman Friedson was very interested in that because a, a lot of that stuff was groundbreaking and would be important to other municipalities and neighborhoods in his district. And then also to compile a document that, that um, identifies where the county is uh, lacking in, in enforcing and, and to present it to him and then and then ask him ask him to help us. And then we can also present it to the other at large members of the council. Great. Don't you think also you, that, excuse me, one quick thing. Don't you think other municipalities would be very interested in this because they have to be dealing with the same thing we are? The county blanketly it gives <laughs> words without real consideration yes. as to what we're going through. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, let, let, let me add a little bit of information there. Uh, in fact, there is an attempt, uh, a meeting being held um, at the end of July in which uh, the municipalities are all going to talk about stormwater issues. And oh, great, great. So there is some movement there. Great. Yeah, that we can, I think through the, through the chapter, the MML Montgomery chapter, we can, I think it's a, a particular problem in the, in our part of the county, and there are many municipalities in our part of the county, and I think they will be interested. Yep. Okay, great discussion there, and thank you for that suggestion, Robin. Uh, sorry, Shannon. Um, Robin suggests we go back to, or, or just refocus this discussion, this portion of the discussion on the current building, current town code, and the stormwater uh, management regulations. As folks may recall, when we adopted those regulations, they were, um, it was recognized that it was just an initial step. It was never expected or intended to be the, uh, the permanent um, legislation or permanent code. The idea is we, we would get some lessons learned and the stormwater committee would also develop more recommendations. So the first question here before us is, what steps can we or should we take to clarify the existing code before we start looking at, are there other steps we should take for a more holistic approach to building regulations to um, improve stormwater management? So I think they're questions of uh, clarifying our intent storage versus treatment and what do we need and uh, formalizing a tiered approach to addressing or achieving stormwater management. And I really like that because it would clarify for the, the builders, for homeowners, what the council's expectations are, that the different actions they can take are not all equal in our eyes. We want to see conservation landscaping as a first approach. And if that's not possible because of the quality of the soil, for example, and then we wanna see structures holding the water. And then if that's not possible, we wanna look at some sort of treatment where water would be held temporarily and then released, just to spell it out. So we're not voting on this now, but this is, to sort of set the stage for us to um, perhaps at our next work session discuss further and provide uh, direction to our town attorney. Um, Debbie, did you have further thoughts there? No, this is good, good, good discussion. Thank you. 
Okay, and Robin, did you have anything more to say before it, we move on? It, in terms of modifying the original code, yeah, there's one other thing that came from Neil Weinstein, in fact, which is to modify the statement where we say the um, one year storm event is 2.6 inch rainfall. We should just say it's a one year storm event and then put in parentheses after that, as of 2022 is defined as 2.6 inches. So that oh, it I see. Will be changed and probably should be changed actually because. Uh, like last Wednesday night, we had a 2.75 inch rainfall, and that's probably going to happen again this year. Yep. Um, but, you know, I mean, not to like keep going back, I only know what I know and about all this stuff. And like to me, I mean, conservation, like landscaping, is not going to be better than capturing water on someone's land and treating it and go off it. Well, <laughs> Um, it should be better if, it, if we can make it work. It's, it's both rain gardens and conservation landscaping. I mean, it, it, and the idea behind them is both that they capture the water and they do capture the water, rain gardens, especially conservation landscaping, not so well. Um, but they also give back. That is to say, um, they are using it to grow plants. Um, and that gives other advantages that uh, dry wells themselves don't do. Obviously, plants are capturing carbon and absorbing more storm water as they grow. So these are increase, an increasing advantage as, as the plants grow. Well, this is not, I mean, to catch the water that flows down our street would not be caught on a, you know, with a, with the, 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 the plants. Right, and that's the tiered approach. That is, you know, you, it won't work in that circumstance. You have to go to the other solutions. That's what it boils down to. Right. So how can we say that our first choice is this, you know, rain garden? If like that's, you know, I mean, so if, it's, if it's possible, do it is, is what we're saying. In some in some contexts, it will be possible in some yards. It will be possible in other yards. It won't be possible. I, I think we're also looking at a combination approach. So if we use the if we describe this tiered approach. Sorry, too many approaches there. If you use the tiered approach, um, maybe the first I don't know, 100 cubic inches of stormwater would be handled by the rain garden because that can be calculated. And then the rest needs to be handled by other, other means. It's not as though they're just put in one rain garden and problem solved because you're right, uh, Shannon. That there's a very specific limited capacity that those gardens can hold. And so it just it, it, like I just fear that everything is left to interpretation of you know trying to piece together like what is it that someone is trying to do you know it's just we 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 do need guidance to um, dug into Matt on how to it, basically what it should be is what percentage of the one year rainfall is captured by the rain garden um, what's left to be captured by other devices that's that's it and so you they get up to 100% by doing multiple things. But I mean, in order to do like a rain garden and to put that in, like we would have to know from the builders, oh, we're going to do 100 feet by X feet is going to be this, 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 in order to do all of those calculations. Um, you know, because again, they, they, they already do that for, in fact, there's a more complex calculation for the county, which they go through. Um, uh, this would actually be a simpler calculation than the county's calculation. And, and, and none of this describe, none of what we're talking about would ever capture runoff. This is just the rain that falls from the sky. Uh, well, the run runoff is generated by the rain that falls from the sky, of course. No, but um, I mean, how you interpret it in your own land. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, let, let me put it this way. You've got two things happening on your soil. One is the rain that's falling on your land. And that, 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 that is the only stuff that we can actually regulate. In other words, when, when a builder, when an owner is building something, we can say, you've got to control the rain that's falling on your land. You've got to capture the rain that's falling on your land up to 2.6 inches um, or whatever the one year storm is. The second thing is runoff that arrives in your land from somewhere else. 
And that's not something that we can regulate with this code. Um, we're, we're trying to approach it in other ways and the Stormwater Committee has some suggestions on that, but the code, code we're currently considering does not address that. Right, but I, th thank you, Ron, but the I think the question I hear Shannon asking is, can a rain garden effectively handle like runoff from the roof in addition to the rainwater that's hitting it directly from the sky? Is, is that correct, Shannon? Yeah, yeah, I just, I'm, oh, I'm having a hard time grasping like how to, how this will all get, I guess, presented. And like, you know, if, if I'm building a house, like trying to understand like how I can, can do it. And then more importantly, how can we enforce it? Because we're not, I mean, we're not experts but, on I mean, it. I'll give you, I mean, my, my, I have a rain garden myself, okay? So it, it handles, uh, 40% of the water from my roof um, up to a, a one year rain event. Um, and in other words, it captures it and disposes of it within 48 hours, which is the standard. Um, it's getting better as the plants grow and it's always capturing more because of that. Um, and and that, that is what rain gardens do. They, they do capture a lot of water, in fact. But, but the 40% roof runoff, we're not asking that of whoever is applying now. We're saying we want 100%. Well, right. And so the point is that, that the rain garden would capture 40% and they'd have to have some way of capturing the other 60%. Um, and that might be structural. It might be a dry well. Um, it might be a rain tank if they can't, got no room for dry wells. That, but certainly it's got to add up to 100%. Yeah. Yep. Okay, um, if, if we're aiming to wrap up at 6.30, I'd like to move us along to at least broach the subject of new approaches we can take in the building code that uh, echoing Shannon's um, vision would have sort of a holistic impact where um, the constraints on the construction would have uh, also have a stormwater management benefit. Um, let's see. So, for example, full replacements of drive driveways would require a permeable driveway. Um, committee could recommend approval of any variance for design incorporating a pool. Um, Right, and came some of the compliance questions. As condition of approval, applicants must enter into a written agreement, maintenance agreement, which they legally commit during the tenure of their home ownership to maintain all runoff mitigation mechanisms. And, and we did that with the, uh, the tanks being installed on Trent. Um, that's actually part of uh, code for the county for tank inspections, but we could do that for things like rain gardens too, because sometimes rain gardens need, need to be cared for and plants need to be replaced in the rain gardens. Uh, sorry, I'm just going through a list and Matt has a list of 17 potential items. Um, we could, um, this is not a code change, it would be a, a process change. We, we, the town could provide a free tree for one free tree a year for residents who want to add trees on their property. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the one about uh, like permeable surfaces. I'm not seeing it. Well, uh we already have that in the code, actually. Um, which is, I mean, it's well, probably need to be permeable. Um, no, but but like um, in our current code, we just I discovered at the house in Trent, the impermeable patio does not count against any constraints we may have. Right. 
Um, That's the kind of stuff I feel like we can change, you know, because a patio is impermeable. We should not, I mean, it should count as what it is. Exactly. Um, and, and we need to tackle the recommendation that we're, that we're considering, or we've talked about briefly in the past, was renovations that are less than a full teardown. Um, so the, the idea here is perhaps a renovation of existing home adding 150 square feet or more of new impervious surface or a combination of surfaces, including steps for walking, oh, sorry, uh, for this provision, all new impervious surface constructed within any two year period will be treated as cumulative. And we, we, would, we would demand net zero runoff for any additions greater than 100, 150 square feet. So, so these are some ideas. We do not have time to discuss them all, but, but perhaps we can go around, people can talk about the few ideas I've, I've voiced here and I'll ask Matt to send this around. Um, I think we need to clarify our existing stormwater code. I think it'll, it's invaluable that we tackle some of these other uh, questions like renovations less than a full teardown. Um, and let's go around in a, well, actually, Robin, with your connection with the, um, engaging with the stormwater committee, you might have more insights into, into these recommendations. Could you perhaps highlight or clarify some of these recommendations or add to my brief list, my brief okay. summary? Right, I, I, sure. Uh, on the renovations, we, we just have to add language on renovations because at the moment it only applies to new construction and we have to put in something on renovations too. Otherwise we are tilting everybody to leave one brick standing and call it a renovation. Now it, it's not exactly that, but that's what we get into. Um, so the question is, are we okay with the 150 square feet or do we want something else there? Um, some people suggested impermeable surface as a way to go also. That's, that's, so those are the things that are um, to be thought of there. Right. Um, so this is sort of homework for folks to, to think about it when, right. when we yeah. maybe yeah. talk yeah. about and it. That, and that, that's, that's a big one. We, we need to do it because we, otherwise we're, we're giving ourselves a trap. Um, on, on the um, permeable driveways, one other fix that we should do is match the county and say permeable driveways is the slope on the driveway is, is, is less than 5% um, or whatever, the, if that's the way the county expresses it. Um, the, the issue is that as the slope gets greater, even a permeable surface just runs the water down over the surface. It doesn't capture any water. So um, there's no point in putting permeable driveway in there. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Um, Debbie? Uh, you're, you're muted, Debbie. Um, I, I agree with Robin that we really have to tackle this whole idea of the renovation and the size. And I'd like to see us be strict on that because it's such a problem here. So I, I would like us to delve into that at some point. The other thing is, and maybe this is the elephant in the room, is the, the size of our new bills or the size of our renovations. I think it's time for us to take a really hard look at how much, how much land we are using to build our houses. And is it realistic that we can really control this runoff and with, with, with such big houses on, on a small amount of land? So I'd really like us to, to look at that and, um, and come up with a plan. I think that's a great point, Debbie. Thank you for, for making it. And I think... Could I, could I just flag a concern yes. there? Because actually Neil, Neil again um, did talk to the committee on this and I have two contrasts here. One is, you know, so two homes intending to have 50% impermeable surface, all right, large homes. One of them is on a lot where uh, all the remaining soil is highly permeable and highly absorbent. So they can put in rain gardens and goodness knows what, dry wells, they can do the whole lot. 
The other one is on poor soil. It's all clay. It's a hilly lot. They can put in almost nothing, maybe a rain tank if we're lucky. If we have a standard of 50% permeable uniform, then we are discriminating against lots with poor soil, basically. Um, and so that's one of the challenges with having an impermeable surface standard, present impermeable surface standard. To think about that too is what I'm saying. I don't really understand okay. that. Well, if- Why are we discriminating against people with bad soil? Well, or good soil. I mean, in other words- Oh, good soil we're discriminating Yeah, against. so if, if you've got poor soil and you're putting 50% impermeable, then water's gonna run off. That's that. Um, if you've got good soil and 50% impermeable, no, you can capture it all, you're okay. And so why do we have percent impermeable when it depends upon the soil that's left? Because we can't decide like, oh, you've got good soil, you've got bad soil, you've got good soil, you've got bad soil. I mean, we have to figure out like, you know, we either want, because so let's say you have good soil. Right. I mean, you're still going to then potentially build a gigantic house that looms over the neighbors that, you know, is a bit too big for the lot. It doesn't matter what their soil looks like underneath, I, yeah, in but, my opinion. Well, well, no, but that's not stormwater at that point. That's, oh. you know, that's a lot so, of it is stormwater. You know, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't because someone's got better soil. And I, I think we need more of an even approach. I think so many of these houses are just too big for their lots. Right. So um, I think, think that, thank you, Robin. I think that's a good observation, Debbie, about the size of the houses. Um, that is a um, potentially a more sensitive uh, topic for the council to uh, to develop codes on. Although we've, and I see your hand, uh, Shannon, just a second. Um, but we, but we have tackled that modestly with constraints on, um, you know, al allowing perturbances. I'm not using the right word, but you know, things oh, like the windows to extend <laughs> into the setback. So we started to constrain it. Um, I think there's a trade-off we just need to be cognizant of that if we if we in, impose rules that limit the um, the size of a house in terms of its uh, footprint, houses might want to go up and uh, to get the same total volume or whatever of within the house. And um, we've seen some issues with some very tall houses um, that I don't feel are in keeping with the character of the town. Um, so in addition to, so, so anyhow, I, I think we should also consider the vertical dimension. I think the, the town attorney mentioned that. Um, it's within our authority. I think we'd have to be um, prudent in how we proceeded there. And Shannon, your turn. Um, so, but you know, the bulk of these people that are making these giant houses in the neighborhood, they have a giant house and then they have a giant garage and they have a giant driveway and they have a giant patio and they have a giant, you know, back deck or whatever on top of that. And so like, we're not, but if we limit the number of imperviousness space on there, they can buy, they can still build a house to their whole specification that I guarantee will be a gigantic house, you know, if they're using that plot of land, but they're going to have to make some more choices in terms of like, well, what else can they have? You know what I mean? Like, it's they want everything. And so I still, it's not like we're saying you can only have a 2000 square foot house. Like that's not what we're saying. We're saying, you know, you just have to might, you might have to make a little bit of a harder choice, whether or not you want to have the extra in-house movie theater, or you want a back deck. Right. Right. Um, great discussion. <laughs> we, we got all the way around. Um, so my, my vision here is that um, we'll, we'll, we'll all, we'll, we'll think about this topic and I'll ask um, the town manager to forward the uh, notes that he provided me to everyone. 
Um, the next council work session will carve out a chunk of time to talk about this. And um, I think there is a lot here. And if we tried to tackle it all at once, I think we could, we could end up spending a long time and not getting anywhere. So um, my preference will be to uh, take this off, tackle this in some bite-sized issues with the first bite being um, revisions to the current code, just to clarify the language. Um, and then we can look at like things like renovations, but maybe there are some easy things we can add like um, uh, the pools, dealing with uh, pools. Um, anyhow, take a look at the list and I'm looking, I'm really excited about moving forward and making progress here. I think it has uh, the potential to be a tremendous benefit for the town um, moving forward. And um, yeah, I look forward to working to you all on it. A any questions or comments for this one? No? Okay, okay well, thank okay. you. Thank awesome. you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council. And uh, just to remind everyone, I hope to see all of you next Monday at noon. I can't believe it's already July 4th. Oh my, yes. And oh you, will all, you, will, uh, you will each um, have a role to play on the agenda on Monday. I hope you're all gonna be there. I should and, be there. Then, and then we have uh, our council meeting on Tuesday at seven o'clock, seven o'clock. <laughs> So see you all then. Thanks a lot. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Good night.